welcome to a webinar on understanding online risks for children. My name is uh, Sonia Livingstone and I'm a professor at Media LSE um, at the London School of Economics and Political Science and I lead the theories um, work package of a European Commission funded project called um, CORE, Children Online Research and Evidence, which is hosting this webinar, as well as working on the Global Kids Online project with UNICEF and the Digital Futures Commission with the Five Rights Foundation, among other projects. And I'm really delighted to be chairing this conversation here today. Uh, as you can see from your screen, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed, and it will eventually be published on the project website uh, at core-evidence.eu as part of our theory toolkit. So please feel free to tweet or post on social media, and please put your questions in the Q&A box on the um, uh, webinar, on the Zoom, and uh, we will come to you uh, after the speakers have each uh, introduced their perspective. So why today's topic? As is being widely discussed in today's fast developing digital ecology, the nature of online risk is continually evolving, sometimes exposing children to emerging risks well before adults know how to mitigate them. This poses challenges to our understanding of children's experience of different types of online risk and the factors that may exacerbate or ameliorate their harmful, their potentially harmful consequences. So how we conceptualize online risk matters for the research that we conduct, for the regulation that we call for, and for the wider public discourse and initiatives that shape children's life outcomes. Children's relation to the digital environment is in many ways uh, contested. Are they victim or villain? Or in less inflammatory language, are they a recipient of online uh, content? Do they participate? Are they an actor, a consumer of the digital ecology and its risks? How, sh how shall we think about their role? So in this webinar, we will debate the theories and concepts that underpin these questions, drawing on some different fields, uh, the field of media and communication, criminology, legal and psychological approaches. And all of these have um, a part to play in helping us to recognize and prioritize uh, questions about how regulatory, technical, social and individual aspects of children's digital lives affects their risk exposure and any consequent harms. So let me introduce our speakers, uh, each of whom has been asked to uh, speak at least initially today from a particular disciplinary perspective in order to kind of draw out some uh, contrasts and uh, debates in, in terms of how we theorize children's online risk. So uh, I'll introduce the speakers in the order in which they're going to um, make their intervention. Uh, Julia Davidson, is a professor of criminology and a director of the Institute of Connected Communities at the University of East London in the UK. Julia is chair of the UK Council for uh, Internet Safety Evidence Group and provides expert advice on policy practice and offending in the areas of cybercrime, online harms and online child abuse to the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, UNICEF, Europol, the US Sentencing Commission, the US Department of Justice and the ITU. She'll be followed by uh, Stefan Dreyer, who is Senior Researcher in Media Law and Media Governance at the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, the Hans Breda Institute in Hamburg, Germany. Stefan is a legal expert in regulatory questions at the intersection of protection of minors, privacy and data protection. Currently, he's working on legal issues of AI-based communication and automated decision-making systems, uh, social bot communication, and the limitations of transparency and disclosure as a regulatory discourse. Uh, Elizabeth Stagsfrud is a professor at the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Oslo, Norway, and chair of the Norwegian National Committee for Research Ethics in the Social Sciences and Humanities and of the European Communication Research and Education Association's Children, Youth and Media section. 
She researches children and online risk, regulation and rights, online censorship and governance and research ethics as part of the EU Kids Online core and Y skills projects. Giuseppe Veltri is Professor of Research Methodology and Cognitive Sociology at the Department of Sociology and Social Research, the University of Trento in Italy. His research interests focus on the study of public opinion dynamics and social representations using a computational social science framework. And he also investigates the development of research methodologies of a computational nature as they apply to social science problems and the intersection with the behavioral sciences. Uh, so those four speakers will, will make their um, interventions and um, we'll have two rounds of questions uh, to them and then we'll come to the Q&A and leading that will be our discussant, um, Maria Stoliva, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And her area of expertise is at the intersection of child rights and digital technology with a particular focus on the opportunities and risks of digital media use in the everyday lives of children and young people, data and privacy online, digital skills, and pathways to harm and well-being. So um, I'm looking forward to the, um, the conversations and interventions that uh, now emerge. I've asked our four speakers each um, in five minutes, um, I think with uh, slides uh, for most of them, uh, to answer the question, how do they, as an expert in their particular discipline or field, conceptualize online risk? What factors underpin it both within and outside the digital domain? And then kind of within that to think about what is, what is children's role in relation to the online risk as they see it. So I'll just kind of emphasize that we're not here inviting um, people to talk about findings or practical and regulatory solutions, though they might, they might touch on those, um, but rather to focus on kind of definitions and models and concepts, because we're trying to clarify the, our tools to think with, the terms that we use, and the assumptions and contextualization and priorities that underpin our different perspectives. So with that all said, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Julia and uh, invite her um, intervention and thank you all for your attention. Julia. Thanks, thanks Sonia. And thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, it's rare these days that I'm asked to present as a criminologist and to focus on the criminological perspective. So uh, it's a rare treat. So by way of introduction, criminology is a very broad area that includes the study of crime, justice, lawmaking and breaking, victims, and more recently, online harms and cybercrime. And this is very much where my work sits. Next slide, please. I think it's fair to say that criminology has largely neglected children online. There are some notable exceptions, but research has really focused on specific harms such as online child sexual abuse and exploitation, there is really little work exploring online risk in the context of children online. A more recent focus in criminology has been on the risk to young people through engagement in different types of cybercrime. Specifically, work in this area has explored exposure to online criminal networks and peer groups, engaging in criminal behavior leading to, for example, recruitment for and participation in financial cybercrime and hacking. Next slide, please. I've got only a few minutes to set the context, so I want to focus briefly on two theoretical conceptual frameworks. The first is digital drift, and second, a new framework under development in the context of our ongoing research, exploring youth pathways into cybercrime. The concept of drift in illegal behaviour originates from the work of early criminologists such as David Matzer, who suggested in 1964 that the majority of us have deviant values, but are able to suppress these through learned skills in the context of social norms. So Matzer claimed that there is a high, higher tendency to commit illegal or deviant acts when young, but that some people kind of drift between conformity and deviance throughout their lives and justify their behavior through what he termed techniques of neutralization. 
Matzer described these as including, for example, denial of responsibility, denial of injury, and denial of victims. Bringing this work up to date, Goldsmith and Brewer in 2014, and later Brewer et al. have applied Matzer's theoretical conceptual framework to a study of what is termed digital drift. So digital drift amongst young people is offered by way of explanation for risk of, risk of and entry into more serious cybercrime such as hacking. The early focus in Goldsmith and Brewer's research was on the ways in which criminal interactions formed online that empower the individual, allowing them to control their involvement in networks or associations and to commit crimes autonomously. Variables such as participant attributes, access to technology and tech competence were measured in relation to different types of online illegal behavior. And Brewer found significant correlations between, for example, online illegal behavior and risk-taking, online and offline criminal acts. Next slide, please. So developing new theory or new theoretical directions that build on existing concepts is the challenge that we face in criminology. In 2016, we conducted research on behalf of the Europol Cybercrime Centre in this area and suggested that a more eclectic theoretical approach is needed. This work was driven by the need to deter young people from serious cybercrime and to raise awareness about often severe sentences. In fact, one young person fairly recently uh, in the UK faced extradition to the US and a possible life sentence for attempting to hack into the Pentagon. Our theoretical framework includes aspects of digital drift, but also incorporates other strands from psychology, such as, for example, John Suller's work on online disinhibition. The framework we are developing includes the following themes absence of online authority figures to guide and deter young people, contextual aspects such as perceived anonymity, opportunity leading possibly to online disinhibition. The motivation we found amongst young people is not always financial, but can, for example, be enhancement of online reputation, seeking the support and encouragement of the peer network and increased self-esteem through peer endorsement. The creation of alternative online social norms which permit and encourage this online behaviour, coupled with the absence of immediate disincentives and sanctions, we feel mm -hmm. are contributory factors. To conclude this very brief introduction, cyber criminology is a new and developing area of criminology. We are currently theory testing in the context of our research, exploring the human and technical drivers of cybercrime. Our part of this large scale H 2020 study includes a survey of 8,000 young people in eight EU countries to explore illegal use of the internet, risk taking, and including drivers, motivations, and attitudes. The aim is to develop intervention and prevention programs for young people and to inform our understanding in this area. I've included a, a website link um, on the PowerPoint for information. And that's the next slide, please. So I really wanted to conclude there by saying that criminology has really had little to say about online risk, children and online risk in the broad sense, but this is a new and uh, developing area. And I think that's it from me, Sonia, for the time being. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a shocker um, that you ended on uh, the idea that criminology has had rather little to say about um, youth and online risk, given um, the importance of both the, the digital um, and young people's kind of often pioneering role in that. Um, uh, I don't know if you have a, a sense of why it is that criminologists have been kind of slow to the party, as it were, or... I think it's because uh, criminology, by definition, really focuses on um, on a, a kind of after the fact in terms of, you know, online offending, criminal justice system approach. And so really, I think there's been uh, a focus on systems, the victim mm -hmm. and the perpetrator experience in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, there's very, been very little focus, I would say, 
on young people's online behavior. Mm. And so my work has really been eclectic. You know, I've used very much a kind of eclectic, eclectic approach, uh, mm. drawing on uh, theoretical constructs from psychology and mm. other disciplines to supplement the work. Mm. So I think it, it's really about the, what criminology has and always has focused on in the past mm. is not mm. necessarily in this area. Mm. I mean, there I is a shift, which I, I hope we're spearheading. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think that's also something that many of us from different um, disciplines and perspectives uh, encounter, which is um, that we are all trying to kind of repurpose our concepts and our theories for this changing world. It's hardly a new world now, but it is a, a changing world and it is a new um, uh, kind of very multidisciplinary space, I think, that we're that we're trying to engage with. Um, Stefan, I'd like to invite your um, intervention and um, perhaps some reflections on, on where, where, where the law and where uh, legal scholarship kind of fits into this. this uh, we can come to the multidisciplinary debate later, but uh, give us a sense of, of, of how the world looks from your perspective. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as everybody knows, if you have three lawyers in a room, you have five opinions at least. So I'm by no means speaking of all lawyers worldwide here, but I can give you a general overview on how law tries to tackle the notion of risks. So in a, in a very quick nutshell, uh, if there's a risk, there's a law. Why is that so? Because risks are seen as threats to legal statutes or positions, uh, including those granted by human rights frameworks. And then law has to do two different things. Before a risk is really realizing into harm, um, it has to mitigate that risk. And if it comes to harm, it has to attribute liability. Those are the, both uh, the two main dimensions that uh, law works like. And um, if you do so, you will have to infringe other people's rights because you either attribute liability or responsibility to them, or you delegate duties or obligations on them. So that's basically the, the, the main issue here to balance the different positions. So when it comes to children online, um, the first question is what are the granted rights here? And um, if you look at the convention of the rights of the child, for instance, you can see that there's a general, uh, sometimes implicit um, obligation for states to ensure an unimpaired development of one's personality. And this is a very broad, broad uh, purpose or target, I'd say. So people have tried to break that down into more tangible sub-dimensions. Um, and I will only tell you two of those, um, mainly the normative targets on the individual level, which is self-reliance or personal responsibility. Some people even say autonomy is the target outcome of unimpaired development and the social dimension, which is social responsibility. So you have to become a part of society um, to, to your full well-being. So now, if you take those two dimensions and say any situation that is able to impair this outcome of my personal or personality development is a risk, um, then you have to apply any kind of yardstick or measure to quantify those risks. And this is where uh, legal scholars usually tend to use um, approaches from risk management. So um, when it comes to the likelihood of occurrence uh, of such uh, risks, there it does not um, suffice that you have any theoretical possibility of that risk, but you need more than that. So it has to be uh, feasible and reasonable um, that you create a risk um, there. Then on top of that, if that risk is becoming really imminent um, and you can feel the danger that the risk is realizing into some form of harm, then we talk about danger in, in law. And that's when uh, the lawmaker is usually um, able to take higher infringement um, or you will see propor proportionality in law uh, in an easier way than if you only talk about risk. And the other dimension is the potential level of impairment. So how big is the harm that could be done when this risk realizes? And again, we are not talking about impairment 
if there's only a theoretical possibility that is not even reasonable, reasonable but you need some kind of um, potentiality of that impairment. Uh, and again, here, legal scholars usually uh, say that it's, if, if there's an impairment, then it's already in the, in the realm of uh, where the legislator can act, um, even more so when it's about potential harm. And those two, those two levels we know of, for instance, European legislation when it comes to impairing content or harmful content. So it's reflected in legal frameworks as well. Now, in the online realm, we can see a lot of phenomena taking place right now. And I'm not saying that all of these are really risks, but we have to look at them from a risk-based approach. Um, and I don't want to talk about any of those. We don't have the time for that. But when we look at these rather new phenomena, we can see, um, from my point of view, three different um, issues evolving from many of those. And those are issues that the legal frameworks do not yet really uh, act on. So one thing is the interaction. So we have like dynamic communicative settings where the child takes part into that communication. We have the algorithmic feedback loops. So ubiquitous surveillance or profiling that then feeds back into loops of what content is being selected or prioritized or whatsoever. So any, many forms of feedback loops taking place there. And the third thing is self-harm, because if you think about criminology or uh, criminal law, self-harm is not reflected in, in those kinds of sanction-based legal frameworks. So for me, three challenges are uh, evolving right now before our eyes. We have um, traditional legal reactions in many areas of law um, that is that are mainly based um, on the situation where the risk already has been realized. Um, so we need a necessary focus on more preventive legal frameworks in those interactive communication settings. And second, we have new forms of, of effects. Well, we have decades of media effect research, but these ones are new because we see ethical hurdles in researching those minors and in interactions because often they are private or even intimate. Um, and we have limited insights into these new forms of surveillance and control where ch children are ubiquitous, monitored and profiled. And we do not know what this um, uh, has, has as consequences for the pers personal development. So law is, really depending on empirical research here, even the more. Um, and what I want to plea for is new forms of cooperation between law and empirical sciences here. Um, we talked about that as listening law, so le legislators that really listen to empirical evidence and transferring science, so scientists that really are able to translate their findings into the realm of lawmaking. And third, but not least, we see new risk dynamics. We are not talking about one risk that is taking place on one service or in one context, but we see a lot of interconnected risks here, um, for instance, between content and contact. And we see fast, escalation, fast escalations um, even across different services or diff different kind of media. So this is really um, a very difficult thing to assess for law right now. And my uh, final thought on, is, on this is that we need new conceptions or conceptualizations of risk assessments in law to tackle those challenges. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Stefan. Um, that was, um, I, I already see lots of uh, intersections and connections also between your, your, your talks. And um, uh, I'm, I'm struck by the way in which both um, Julia, and then you, um, in accounting for risk to children and young people, offer an account also of the nature of that digital environment because it affords interaction or anonymity. Um, and and we could, you know, in fact, in our next webinar, we'll give some attention to how we characterize that that digital environment. I, 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 I if I can just ask the the inclusion of self harm as the kind of a, a really significant new challenge in your 
in your perspective. Um, is that because, as it were, it is a, a, a crime without a, or a problem without a perpetrator somehow, uh, um, that it's, it's hard to point the finger at, at who is to yeah. blame? Um, the, yeah. the question behind that, um, at least one of the central questions is, if you think about the Convention on the Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. then everything is built around the child that has to um, uh, ensure uh, well-being and uh, uh, a healthy um, uh, growing up. But mm -hmm. what happens if one of those children really is the perpetrator in those scenarios? Mm -hmm. um, are we then, is, is that outside of that um, context mm -hmm. or do we need to find ways to get that well-being into the child again? So um, mm -hmm. that is really interesting. And maybe mm -hmm. it's uh, a reason, like Julia said, that criminology has not uh, focused so much on, on these issues, mm -hmm. because then mm -hmm. we are talking about criminalizing youth, which uh, we don't want to. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, excellent. I think these are, these are um, exactly the kinds of challenges that we, that we wanted to focus on. And um, Perhaps on that question of, yes, uh, children as innocent or angels or devils. Um, Elizabeth, I think you're going to say something about how this is, in fact, quite a long uh, discourse. And uh, yeah, <laughs> from, from your perspective, uh, start yeah. if you wish. Yes, I'll share my presentation. Uh, and and uh, hi, everyone. OK, so. Um, so I come from the media and communications field, or, uh, and of course you, the the question that was asked uh, was, you know, how do we I conceptual uh, conceptualize online risk as somebody from the media field? But perhaps uh, I should tell you all that uh, media scholars uh, often I think can be referred to as the magpies of the academic world. We tend to steal and borrow from all other disciplines, which makes it uh, fun, but also quite confusing. So perhaps uh, this is better known as what I've learned or um, borrowed from other disciplines. Uh, and I think that that's something like media scholars often do because we're all about context and seeing things in relation to each other. And especially then the media, of course, as, as a core, but still the context around that digital or around that media technology is where we thrive. So what have I learned from the other disciplines? Well, just like Stefan, uh, I think that insights from the natural sciences are actually quite useful. So seeing risk as something that is a combination of uh, likelihood of it will happen, which can go from never to, you know, almost certain or even certain, and how that is combined with level of harm or level of impact, and how these can vary. So you can have a low likelihood of happen, but a very uh, high level of harm if it happens, or likelihood of something happen, which is very high, but the actual harm is not uh, the impact is not that big. And understanding that risk has this complexity is extremely important. Also, I think when we're going to understand and talk about risk for children, not all risks are harmful necessarily or have the same level of harm. So risk is on the one side calculation. It's something that we can calculate often. Uh, we can, we can, we can use, do the maths. It also is also uh, often a known potential, and it's intrinsically linked to this uh, idea of impact of harm. I also had some insights from the social sciences, which I think it's worth building on when you think about theory, which is what this webinar is about. So risk is a potential, but it hasn't really happened yet. It's something that is an anticipation of something, which is an uncertainty, but we don't really know what will come out of it. We can, we can calculate and we can guess, but it could also be positive. It could be building a resilience, which is you know, something that we talk a lot of with children. It could be that development, which is so important. So risk as in harmful per se is something that is really important, I think, to avoid when talking and using theoretical concepts and also when doing empirical research. So this excitement of risk, I think we should, we should try to, in, to include more. It could be good. Something nice can come out of this. 
So let's talk about it in a more complex way. And, and one of the things, and I know this is not an empirical, but, but just to, for those of you who don't know the, the online risk field well, it, I, I was reminded of this when I did a report with my colleague, uh, Monica Barbowski, where we looked at uh, the predicted probability of uh, youth in Norway being upset when receiving sexual messages online. And this is by age and gender. And what we saw was that being upset by receiving sexual messages actually is decreasing by age for girls. Not all, I mean, many girls find it upsetting, but, but not everyone. Some actually thought this was okay or it didn't bother me. And that gives a complexity to re receivement of risk also that we need to, to understand, which that not all children are the same. And when we ask the boys, none of them ever thought this was a problem at all. So while we talk about online risk, for instance, sexual risk in a way in research and in the public eye as something that is potentially harmful. And when children themselves experience this as the best thing that happened all week, we add on to that complexity and we might, we might think about how we can explain these differences. So, so, and I think my final insight is that risk perception is more on the agenda, both in terms of research and in particular in terms of uh, public discourse than actual risk assessments. And that risk perceptions, the perception of risk, the idea that a risk might happen can give the same symptoms on the individual or it can affect a family dynamic or influence our society in terms of regulation the same way as actual risk can do. And I mean, in media and, and also other fields, we use concepts like, for instance, uh, moral panics, media panics, but this sense that not understanding the complexity of risk can actually give effects and impact us in a way that might not be helpful and can also not be necessary is important also to understand. And that this uncertainty infused by worry, which is key in, in online realm, is a dangerous mix that might have implications on all analytical levels for the individual child, for the social level, for the family, for the school, for digital ecology, for the societal level, and for the national level. So studying online risk is to combine the rational with the irrational, which is something I think media scholars are, some of the people that should, should do this. And of course, to combine what has been before in neat regulatory boxes into one big lump. It's not about the health service anymore. It's not about the legal frameworks and what is criminal. It's not about the schools. Everything is online and that adds to the complexity. Uh, and final observation, when we study and talk about online risk, we mostly do it retrospectively. And this is a theoretical problem. So we talk about it as something that already has happened while risk is something that actually has not happened yet. And we should perhaps start to think about it. So what is needed from a theory? Well, I think it's needed a theory that can encompass context, that can include all analytical levels, and that allows for an interdisciplinary and common vocabulary, as this is indeed a cross interdisciplinary research field. I have some suggestions for what kind of theory that could be or what kind of good theories. I'm not going to do that now, but maybe we can talk about it if you have questions later. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. And uh, yes, um, I, I'll align myself with the media and uh, communications perspective um, uh, and that kind of sense of being the magpie. Um, uh, maybe, Elizabeth, you could just say something about um, uh, where to look, as it were. What drives that sense of I want to take a bit from here and a bit from there, and this is what we're trying to kind of build up? Um, what kind of makes that hold together or, or take a certain direction? Yeah, so maybe uh, theoretically, what is often needed is, is those theories that can lift from that individual risk or that individual psychological uh, uh, or, 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 or uh, you know, individual variables or what is going on on the regulatory level and look at it as a whole. So those large theories that can lift our perspective into more societal and contextual um, mm -hmm. frameworks, it's helpful. 
Mm -hmm. I, uh, it, uh, it's, it's not uh, a secret uh, that I'm a big fan of uh, Ulrich Beck's, uh, not risk society thesis, but his institutionalized individualization that encompasses both this mm -hmm. sense of individuality and what happens when we have this new thing coming and nobody really knows what to do and nobody really knows how to give advice combined uh, uh, with this happening to everyone. So, mm -hmm. so this frustration of the modern, uh, late modern uh, individual parent and researcher is something that I can relate to. If that makes sense, Sonia. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, great, thank you. Um, and I can see um, questions coming into the, um, the uh, chat um, and some in the Q&A also. So I think, yes, we are, you are all together already uh, generating some thoughts from our um, participating audience. But first we'll um, come to uh, Giuseppe's um, presentation. And Giuseppe, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that when you and I um, wrote a paper together, we use that risk management theory and I think everyone has referred to it. So um, I don't know if that's a starting point for you or if you've moved on in your thinking, but um, I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Well, I, I, I probably will touch upon that, but uh, I, I wanted to start from a slightly broader perspective, which is in line in, in terms of uh, why I, I have come across uh, the issue of online risks uh, concerning children. In my case, uh, I, I, I can say that it's probably incidental in the sense that I was working and I'm still working in the kind of broader area of what a now uh, I sort of summarize as digital challenges, but dig digital challenges for what? For, in a way, the cognitive tools that people use in navigating and using the digital environment. And the digital environment is something that now has become such an uh, interconnected part with uh, the way how we, we decide about things, we, we inform ourselves and so on. And what I found interesting here is that uh, in this context, the type of research I've been doing, which is mainly behavioral research, has found that there is a huge amount of things happening online that are very difficult, first of all, to capture with traditional research methods. So uh, many, many tools we used to have, you know, surveys, self-reported data, they don't really help you into that because when you have here is behavioral modification of users through complex interactions between the way our environments present information, how we make choice in these online uh, environments. And so we have at least these four areas, which I think are crucial. And in a way they can easily overlap or kind of connect with each other. So the first one is the sort of persuasive manipulative choice architecture that, that refers to all these aspects about the so-called dark patterns. So ways in which we can structure interaction online so that people do certain things rather than others because they make appeal to the way how we reason and how particularly, in, in, well, in adults as, as much as children, we use cognitive shortcuts to, to uh, decide about things. Then we have, uh, of course, related to somehow to that, we have distracting environments. So attention is the scarce commodity online. So a lot of, of, of resources are dedicated by many platforms to, uh, in a way, structure the way our uh, adults and children uh, use attention. And so it, it's another big challenge. Then we have all uh, the, the areas that was already mentioned in, in, the, in some of the previous slides by previous speakers, the, all the algorithmic tools and filters that they actually play an active role in the way how they shape again, the environment that we interact online and children as well. And then of course we have the area which is now is becoming a lot of attention, you know, misleading information, fake news and so on. I think all these, they have specific challenges and they also require specific way of investigation. But I think the problem is that all of these areas, they, I think th their effect on children is largely unknown in the sense that we discussed about, you know, potential harm, but actually we don't know what the harm is. And as you remember, Sonia, we did a work about, you know, online marketing uh, for children in terms of, uh, you know, essentially, uh, a combination of some of these elements here where um, we employ 
other games. And other games are so powerful in the way how they shape, uh, from a cognitive perspective, the, the children preferences that all the traditional way of defending them, you know, saying, well, look, this advertising signaling, it, is, it was advertising everywhere. It didn't make any difference really. And the only solution we found was a solution a protective solution actually was very difficult to implement from a policy perspective. So if we look at the entry points from policy interventions, what I found is something that has emerged in some of the uh, talks before is that actually it is interdisciplinary by definition because we have different elements working together and it won't be possible to tackle the, the, the several type of online risks that, that are presenting to adults and children by just using one element. So regulation needs to be informed by psychological and social science research. But at the same time, we also need to tackle the element of education. Uh, and, and we need also the element, of course, of uh, the technology, how technology could use to uh, help children and adults alike to defend themselves from some of these uh, potential threats. So we have, this sort of loop, which I think it's, it's difficult actually to do because a lot of research is done in disciplinary terms. So this, this interaction didn't, doesn't happen. And, and often we speak different languages, we use different concepts. And of course, uh, what, you know, we, we said that in many, in, in, in many occasions. I would uh, add another element to stay in the five minutes that often we need new segmentation to kind of clarify what are the vulnerable people, what's going on there. And I, I have this, this work that I never finished to my own shame that uh, what I found is that in these data we have collected in, on a, on, in several countries about uh, how parents perceive risks uh, uh, concerning their children. What I found is actually parents construct the risk perception in, in different ways. And there are certain patterns that are similar across different countries, meaning that actually you can identify uh, particular styles in building risk perception, which perhaps is a way that can shape the way how we can intervene from a policy perspective, but also suggest that you don't have one solution for all. You need to, to think about much more sophisticated segmentation strategies in terms of having tools in a way they cannot perhaps custom made for each individual, but for you know, groups of individuals that we know more or less are, are present and, and they think alike. So I think that's uh, my contribution. Then of course, I'm happy to engage with all the speakers and the questions, but uh, you know, I'm already over the five minutes, so I'll stop here. Wonderful, thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. And um, I think it's very thought provoking the way you end with the idea of different, um, uh, rethinking our kind of segmentation. I think for a while, um, um, kind of applied uh, researchers and those trying to intervene in the field have been thinking, how do we, how do we understand questions of, let's say, a resilience or vulnerability, and according to what? But I think we have um, not made enough headway there in the way you're suggesting in terms of resilience and vulnerability in relation to particular risks or in relation to particular ways in which the digital world um, assails us, as it were. I don't know if you yeah. have, yeah. And also, I think, you know, what it shows is also that uh, it, 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 you cannot easily delegate to parents, for example, because they will be as vulnerable as, as children on, on, in many of those areas. Oh. So you know, we have to think more holistically in that, in that sense. I mean, it's the environment that needs to change. And at the same time, we need to boost resilience of both parents and children. And so it's this complex sort of multi-layer intervention that might have a chance to work. So, Yeah, fantastic. So uh, thank you. And thank you all um, for uh, being concise and setting out very, I think, eloquently and uh, giving us a real sense of the different perspectives from which people uh, and, and scholars approach what is clearly a kind of a, a shared um, problem they're not always understood in, in the same way. So um, I think um, listening to uh, Julia discussing the role of children 
particularly in relation to the perpetration of risks and that idea of kind of digital um, digital drift um, and pathways towards risk, um, which brings in questions of their vulnerability. Um, is, is interesting and how are we going to intersect that with the, the, the very kind of um, long list of risks that Stefan uh, outlined that lawyers need to address um, uh, in developing uh, legislation. I, I, I think sometimes I live in hope that where there's a risk, there's a law, but um, uh, I'm not always sure I, I, I see it in, this, in, the, in the digital domain, um, but I think that's partly what we are, we are debating um, here. Um, Elizabeth has set um, uh, those same risks in, if you like, a kind of wider um, sociological and historical context. And in that word context, of course, is all of life. Um, everything else that all the other uh, disciplines um, study when they're not particularly thinking about the digital domain. So um, I, I appreciate also her caution against moral panics and even an argument that is sometimes um, controversial, but I think important that in some ways risk is necessary. Um, and then um, Giuseppe has, I think, taken us uh, back um, or kind of forward perhaps to some of the, um, the, the unfolding and emerging ways in which technology is designed to interact with our people's vulnerabilities, children's vulnerabilities or susceptibilities or indeed interest in risk in ways, showing ways in which the behavioral and data sciences kind of amplify that risk and perhaps amplify those pathways that, that Julia was um, talking about. So in a minute, I'm going to ask the uh, speakers to reflect on what the others have said and kind of take this um, a little more into the multidisciplinary debate that I think we, we really believe uh, is, is, is necessary for for this um, field. But I first want to just briefly um, pause and uh, draw to uh, your attention the report that we in the core network uh, released uh, just uh, the other day on Monday, uh, in which we tried to think about the uh, all that all those different risks and the classification of risks that we're talking about, um, not to put uh, online risks into neat boxes where we think they'll stay, uh, but to kind of get a sense of the range of um, the range of risks that we're talking about and whether there are some ways of organizing them that can be uh, insightful in its, in its own right. And we produced that report after a very uh, lively discussion with uh, InSafe and InHope, who are the uh, European and beyond European uh, networks of uh, practitioners uh, who are seeking to uh, develop the tools to uh, mitigate or ameliorate or, or respond to the risk that children face across across Europe. And that's when I got a very strong sense of, of, of the practicalities of theory, if you like, how theory can be uh, useful in, in practice. Um, so I'll just um, briefly share with you the the, the classification that we have, um, some of us iterated in many forms uh, over the years, actually. And um, after talking to um, InSafe and InHope, we have um, offered this uh, yet again, another iteration. One that tries to, if you like, put Stefan's long list into um, some meaningful order. Uh, those who are um, in the UK, we are currently passing an act which is uh, famous for its laundry list of risks. Um, and again, we're trying to put them in order. And what we're trying to prioritize here is attention to the way in which um, the role of the child. Uh, the speakers are variously engaged with the idea of, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and recognizing the child as an agent but without burdening the child with the responsibility for all that follows. And I think that's a, a conundrum that, that we are all trying to find a, a language for. Um, so here in, in core, we've thought about those, a classification of risks in terms of content, contact, conduct, and contract to recognize um, the different ways in which children engage, but are also engaged with by um, the digital world and those who, um, who, who uh, uh, occupy it and who, who, who come into contact with the child through the digital, the digital world. 
Um, so not to put things in, um, in kind of um, neat boxes, but to give us a, a framework within which we can say, perhaps this is the range of things we're talking about when we talk about online risk. Um, and these are the intersections and connections, because of course, in, in reality, um, they, they, they all intercorrelate and, and interact. And then that uh, what, what has been proposed and increasingly proposed from both the theory and the practitioner community is the sense that there are some cross-cutting risks, some ways in which we, we need to be thinking um, of new ways in which the digital environment affords risks to children uh, that cut across their um, different ways of engaging with the digital world uh, in ways that are yet to be understood. And the speakers have, I think, um, uh, engaged with, with, with quite a number of those uh, too. So that's that's in our um, uh, the report we released. And I just wanted to kind of draw people's attention to it. Um, also, in fact, in response to one of the questions in the, in the chat about opportunities, because um, uh, the EU Kids Online Network has always said risks and opportunities go hand in hand, both empirically, conceptually, and uh, in terms of policy and intervention. Uh, so perhaps, um, so we're planning a next future webinar and report around classifying and identifying what those online opportunities might be. I think just as it's often not clear what risks we're talking about, it's also often not clear what opportunities we're, we're talking about. So um, that's all to come. Uh, but um, with that kind of some of those wider issues in mind and thinking also about the different perspectives of the speakers, um, I'm going to invite them all and um, perhaps as a, a slightly kind of shorter and more informal intervention to kind of go round in turn and give us a sense of, of, of what what triggered your thoughts in what's said so far and what um, might be uh, taken back to a home discipline or um, where there are points of contention perhaps? Um, are we talking past each other as we use the same words in different ways? Um, uh, any, any reflections? And then we will come to audience questions um, in about um, 10 minutes. So uh, please do carry on putting in your questions. I know that Maria is... Um, uh, uh, collecting them and uh, putting some order to them perhaps. Uh, Julia, can I, can I come to you first and ask for your reflections on what's, what's said so far? Thank you. Yeah, yes, thanks Sonia. I was listening with interest to, uh, to the other speakers and uh, just picking up a, a couple of threads. Um, certainly in terms of Stephen's work, thanks for your work, your uh, presentation around the legislation. And uh, we do a lot of work with, uh, with legislators actually in this space, Stephen, trying to think about the implications of the empirical evidence and uh, trying to, to think about the, the position of young people in terms of legislation as well. And, and just two points I wanted to make. So the first is really to pick up on a challenge in this area. And I know our conversation is around risks today, but I think it's very difficult uh, not to, to talk about harms as well in the context of risk, particularly from my perspective, because a previous work I've done has focused on uh, child sexual, online child sexual abuse and online child sexual exploitation. And I just wanted to, to say that one of the, the biggest barriers, I think, in terms of legislation across the EU and beyond the EU is a, is a lack of um, uniformity, if you will, across jurisdictions and that the difficulties that this presents, I can see Stephen nodding, I'm sure, I'm sure you know what I'm alluding to, but um, you know, the fact, for example, that we don't have a consensus around the age of informed consent across jurisdictions makes this a challenge in terms of the, the kind of legal definition of child. So I, I think that's, that's one issue I wanted to pick up on. And the second point, Stephen, you mentioned um, the criminalization of young people. And uh, I think, you know, you threw criminology a lifeline there in terms of a, a kind of convenient excuse for, <laughs> for, for not focusing very much in this area, but, but actually you make a good point. And I think in the work that we've been undertaking, what we've been trying to do is to identify the pathways into cybercrime, but then think about the points of intervention, you know, so at what point 
at what point can we start working with young people to channel, channel their extraordinary tech competences into to more legal routes, into less deviant routes? You know, and then in terms of the criminal justice system, what can the criminal justice system do for young people who are convicted of these crimes so that we don't see them facing really long sentences, which is what's happened in the past. So I think it's about really about intervention and prevention in terms of the criminalization of young people. And we must also remember that criminology is not just about the, the study of law breaking, it's also about a, a deviance as well. So behaviours that we might characterise as deviant, but are not necessarily about formal law breaking. And then I think just one other uh, point to pick up on with Elizabeth is the, I appreciate what you were saying, Elizabeth, around, um, you know, drawing on other, other areas in your work. And I think we all do this in this area by necessity because you know it really is a kind of multidisciplinary area and, and I think that's one of the, the positives one of the benefits is that we see this area from so many different perspectives but uh, I will claim moral panics for criminology <laughs> in the work of Stan, the early work of Stan Cohen which I'm sure you're familiar with in the 1970s uh, but moving on that uh, thesis has been applied to uh, serious offenders and, and sex offenders. And I think I just wanted to say on a note of caution that sometimes, and I know that feminist criminologists have really emphasized this point as well, that sometimes, you know, in the search for moral panics, that actually we can lose sight of harm. And, um, you know, there's sometimes a kind of unintended consequence around uh, using the, the kind of moral panic thesis when we know that there are real harms. You know, I've worked directly with victims over a long period of time, and we know that there are real harms. So I think I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. And I think that's it for me. Oh, well, thank you, Julia. Um, and uh, I love that you've thrown um, some uh, questions and challenges directly to uh, the speakers. So let me turn to uh, Stefan and um, uh, feel free to um, respond to Julia and also raise any other points that you would, you would like. Yes, I think um, the first thing that struck my mind was the notion of risk reception. What relevance does risk reception have um, in, in this context? And I wondered uh, whether we should really count that in into, at least in, into legislation, because what we come up with is that, for instance, moral panics will result in different risk perceptions that will, will result in laws that may or may not tackle the underlying problem. And then the risk reception is uh, gotten better, but the risks, the underlying, underlying mm -hmm. risks, not so much. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about some symbol or symbolic politics here. Mm -hmm. um, so I am rather hesitant when it comes to counting in risk of reception. And mm -hmm. the studies that we conducted in Germany, at least, where we questioned parents and their children apart from each other regarding their risk receptions. It turns out the parents have risk receptions very much based on the public, uh, well, public debate on alleged online risks, while the children had a completely, or not at all completely, but a rather different risk reception um, that was based on their own experiences uh, in, in the digital realm. So there, there might be differences between those two generations then. Um, that was the first thing. And the other was um, how, to, how to tackle the different, um, well, let's take the four Cs. I, li I like that approach very much. Um, so when we talk about content related risks, uh, regulation has a long standing experience of how to tackle content related risks. So there is something to build on and when it comes to contract related risks, we always have contractual law, so we can grab that. And that is something that regulation can make rather tangible um, and approachable. But when it comes to contact and conduct, we are entering um, an area where we talk about private messaging or intimate um, conversations. So there are human rights that intervene um, and that prohibit us and the state to have a look into those conversations um, for good reasons. 
So we cannot come up with simple solutions here to, to um, look into those things and to, well, at, uh, we don't know what's happening basically. Um, and that's where we need new forms of um, interventions or provision or uh, protection. So, and that's, I think where two lines are meeting right now, looking at regulatory developments. One is that we change from, um, from very static forms of protective regulations towards more um, providing infrastructural support in advance. So um, helping to self-help the, the children that are in, in danger there because we cannot go into, into that communication. That is one thing um, in the UK, it's the duty of care, for instance, and we have the same since last Friday in Germany, when it comes to infrastructure um, instrumenten, infrastructural instruments or tools. Um, and the other thing is uh, that um, the, oh, I forgot that one. And I, ca I cannot read my own writing right now. <laughs> Sorry, um, maybe it comes to my mind later on so yeah. far. No, 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 thank you. Um, and I, I now see much more clearly why you emphasize the importance of interaction as, as a kind of emerging risk, because that's where the law is, is, is less um, uh, familiar in its, in its resources. Um, Elizabeth, oh, may I, may, oh, it yeah. just came to my, back to my mind. The other thing is that we are going away from command and control conditional legal right. programming of procedures or whatsoever, mm -hmm. um, we, we enter a, a time where we base uh, our regulations more on principles mm -hmm. and then delegate the interpretation and the solution to these principles towards third parties, for instance, platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that is the new thing to, mm -hmm. to tackle here and to approach I, from my point of uh, view. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Elizabeth. Yes, uh, <laughs> my magpie interdisciplinary brain has just gone in overdrive because I, I got so many ideas. So like Stefan, I have problems uh, interpreting my own writing, but I think for me, uh, so, so one of the things that's really interesting and, and when we often, and also having been part of EU Kids Online for a very long time, uh, we always say that we start out with the rights-based perspective. So we start out with children's rights. And what I was reminded now and what, what I, I find challenging but also very exciting is uh, when we talk about rights and we talk about it interdisciplinary, including those who work with legal frame, frameworks. Because for me, rights are much more than the legal. I mean, it's it's it. So some of it is legal, but rights have it encompasses so much more. And I was fascinated by this one slide where, where where legal frameworks and ethics was put together. And for me, it may be the ethics uh, which has which spills over, and sometimes it's even contradictory to legal frameworks, is exciting. And I think it's, it's challenging, but I think it's important. So what I struggle with sometimes is precisely that we as researchers find find our common language where we can talk about rights without having to being um, forced or, or having to go the route of, of understanding it through a, a legal lens. But we can talk more general about rights. And, and that for, my, for me, that is, is challenging and something I, I sort of was reminded of. Um, I think also that um, uh, that risk cannot be be handled through legal frameworks or that that is not the solution it's, it's one of many helpful instruments that we can have and and the challenge is that very often in the public and and i i, I find this as researchers also we are we are sort of have this demand to give advice to give policy advice and what is it that we what kind of law should we have what kind of, you know, how can we regulate this? But not all risks can be regulated into submission. Uh, we, we need to, to allow for a situation where, uh, and, and as uh, we, we, we started to talk about moral panics, but of course in my field, we are much more prone to use media panics as a concept where you have this combination, this fear of often new technology and youth 
com like th this deadly combination which creates so much worry and so much anxiety and so much uncertainty that it often ends in these knee-jerk regulatory moves which is uh perhaps seen as been doing something but as stefan said not actually addressing the underlying problem or actually helping anyone in terms of getting a better life so i think that if we can theoretically but and conceptually have this this conversation and perhaps have a better bridging between the legal uh, and the rights based frameworks and and the empirical work i think that would be uh, fantastic uh, and also because uh, it will help uh, understand some of these complex issues like and I was again reminded with say like parents and worry and and we have the same findings throughout empirically uh, not only that parents have different perceptions of risk and the likelihood of risk and it's often tainted or or influenced by media uh, framing and and uh, how how often something is uh, so the likelihood might be low but because the media mentions it a lot that is the big fear of parents but also um that it's this concept of and we measure this again and again parents are really worried about the type of risks that will happen to their child somebody external media a pedophile another child will will harm their children but they're rarely worried about their children posing a risk to others or to themselves and that creates complexity for us and finally, um, I realize, Sonia, I'm really critical about the last C, the four Cs. So I think we have to talk about that some more. But I don't, I don't maybe think that that thinking of some of this abuse, like like uh, sexual abuse and some of these other things, as contract, might be something that is uh, it's not a legal or an implicit contract. So maybe maybe that can create some misunderstandings that could be avoided. Yeah. Very, very, very happy to uh, debate with you, uh, Elizabeth, now as ever, but in the interest of time, I'm going to come to Giuseppe and then we'll come to the Q&A um, and uh, maybe people will raise things in the Q&A also. But Giuseppe, um, yeah, lots of talk. Where do you, what, what has triggered your yeah. brain cells? Um, well, um, I can say a couple of things. I mean, the, I think you know the, the the issue of risk perception is useful up to a certain point in the sense that risk perception to me implies always the kind of uh, awareness of risks that you know if it is disengaged with the potential real harm or of, of, of some online threats, it's a problem. So you know we have the moral panic, but we also have the opposite. So uh, the privacy paradox. You know, if people think they care, you know they say they care, but they don't do anything about privacy, or they underestimate uh, the problems that you know that, that could happen about privacy and other forms of of risks. Uh, to me, the, the most underestimated are the ones that I mentioned before, the dark dark patterns, which are terribly influential, but people don't even know they exist. Okay. The other problem is that um, the you know the uh, the issue of of let's say uh, risk perception is, so is important of course but but then the question is uh, uh, for some of these new risks okay the harm of those okay is is unclear I mean it, it could be that you know uh, I make the example that I, I know a bit more about you know let's say fake news okay. So in the beginning, there was all this concern about the effect of fake news. And we do know that some effects they, they have, but to what extent you know, they have an effect is still unclear. And there is recent evidence that this you know, shows that, that they don't really have that effect on people, okay? Now, the question is, okay, uh, but, but you know, we need to, to, have, to have research in order to assess that because we don't know beforehand. And the other problem is that uh, uh, these things are constantly changing. And, and that, that's where I see the problem with regulation. So if you have regulation, let's say, in an area where I've done research, online gambling, well, it takes two seconds for a, for a platform to change the mechanism uh, implemented in an online gambling website. And the, the legislator you know, will never know because they can revert to the original thing in, in again in, in 10 minutes. So clearly, regulation provides some kind of protection, but ultimately is an issue of building up resilience. Now, I do 
also trust in human, you know, put trust into human beings that we are capable of finding strategies of resilience, you know, also on our own. And if I have to self-criticize my own approach, I would say that that is, I mean, all the stuff I said, they kind of work very well if you consider all individual response to these threats. But actually, we don't know much about how people through social interaction, through, through some kind of social distributed condition, they solve some of these threats. Okay. So I'm, I'm uncertain about certain source of information. You know, I have people I can ask, I can have cross validation. But again, we don't know how effective that, that is. There are other types of risks where all this stuff doesn't work. And I'm, I'm, I'm the first to say, I mean, uh, I'm in the classification that Sonia showed, I all have been dealing with content and contract, really, these, these two elements, which, you know, uh, uh, where I think, you know, there is this complication now of, let's say, uh, implicit effect that they have uh, choice architecture and environment, digital environments. But for other areas, I cannot simply say anything, uh, you know, like, for example, the case of uh, uh, bullying or, or other forms of uh, online risks where, I mean, it, it exists already a vast literature, so I'll stop. Um, thank you, Giuseppe. I think you take us back, um, actually, several of you to one of the, the kind of biggest conundrums, which is how to get from the individual back to the societal level and address some of those um, wider um, issues. But I'm going to um, pass the floor now to Maria, who has been keeping an eye on uh, the very lively uh, chat and Q&A and um, see what, uh, what she can do in the time we have to um, uh, respect the contributions from the audience. Thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you to the speakers and to the audience. Uh, they've been really active in exchanging some ideas and asking questions, and a lot of the concerns uh, in, in the questions relate to what can we do to fix this, uh, and how can we fix sometimes platforms which on the surface seem child-friendly, but they can be used for something which is uh, quite harmful, uh, such as grooming. A lot of uh, questions relate to the sort of uh, the extreme uh, harmful effects of of the internet. There's also some of the discussion which uh, hinged on what is the role of children and their voices. Uh, and in, in many aspects, and I think in the different disciplinary approaches, children are often not the ones who define the frameworks. They're not the ones that have the, the power to decide uh, how we understand risk, how we uh, regulate uh, even legally or how we respond to, uh, to this. So how can we balance uh, that children's understanding and experience of risk might be different from what the legal and sort of adult-based frameworks uh, might be? Uh, what is the balance between privacy and protection was, um, again, one of the areas that, that was raised. How can we do this and protect children's uh, privacy as well? Well, um, a lot of the questions related to children's different circumstances, for example, uh, to what extent children's lives and diversity in lives can inform uh, the way that they experience uh, the internet and the way that they experience risk. I think some of the speakers spoke to, uh, to that in relation to the difference between risk and harm and that it doesn't uh, play out in the same way for, for different children. Some of the questions related to the, to the legal frameworks uh, what do we see as the role of the states when there's the diversity in the legal frameworks? And also a lot of the interest was around whose job is it to fix it? Uh, what is the role of educators? How do we see the role of teaching children, teaching parents, teaching uh, you know, all adults uh, in, in relation to child protection? or child services uh, to, to support children in the best way? Or is it the role of the industry? Do we need to start with a safe internet um, at the beginning? Uh, so I think from, from all of this, maybe the, the intuitive question uh, to ask all the speakers is, uh, where do we go next? And what are the biggest gaps in our understanding at the moment based on uh, each disciplinary approach? So what, what is the one thing that you would like to maybe know or fix at the moment so we can move towards uh, a safer uh, internet? Because I think this, this is the anxiety around how can we do things better? Brilliant. Thank you, Maria. Um, that was a, a, a very impressive whistle-stop tour of lots of lots of uh, comments, um, and I do very warmly thank um, all the um, 
uh, everyone who's participating, uh, some of whom are kind of uh, old friends to our webinars, which is also very nice to see people uh, engaging in the dialogue as, as, as these issues unfold. Um, yes, so uh, should we, 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 we have a, a minute or so uh, for each speaker, if you want to give us a sense of what's the next, I don't know, the next intellectual challenge, as, as Maria put it, or what's the biggest obstacle to our understanding as you, as you perceive it? Because there is somehow still a lot of confusion when we talk about children online risk. And uh, I don't say that we can all come to a consensus, but a little more clarity and light would probably be helpful. Julia, what are your, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, Sonia, I was just thinking that um, I'll comment from a criminological perspective and then I'll step outside of that and comment from a personal perspective very briefly, if that's OK. So I think there are huge challenges for criminology moving forward to embrace this area more. And uh, I'd like to see much more research focusing on uh, young people's experience. Um, both inside and outside of the criminal justice system in, in terms of risk. So I, I think that's the challenge for criminology. Um, from a personal perspective, I think the challenge is really to, to move the debate much more from the global north to the global south. And I know that you've been doing this with the work you've been conducting as well around global EU kids online. And, you know, we've been working in, in Africa, for example, uh, trying to move the child online protection um, agenda forward. And so I think for me, it's about moving the risk debate from, I think we're fairly well rehearsed in terms of the global north. And I'd really like to see some of the funding and the debate move to the challenges that face the global south because they are, they are really quite serious, significant, uh, given the kind of exponential increase of digital and use of digital amongst young people in the global south and i think that's a, a big challenge for us mm -hmm. thank you um yes very 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 it, it, it's a huge challenge actually and um we have um not only um and of course research has been done in very many different countries um and vastly expanding the context that elizabeth um talked about uh, earlier on but also, of course, posing challenges to what it is we think we already know, let alone um, what it is we need to know uh, next. Um, Stefan, how do, how do lawyers think about that global context, or are you always in a national legal frame? And what, and what, well, yeah. and what for you is the understanding gap? I'm, I'm going to go away, by the way, and think about the fantasize, but the listening lawyer is, is my concept from you. Yeah. <laughs> really we need more of those, definitely. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> um, globality and law is not very compatible. Uh, mm. Laws are made by national legislators and they have the, uh, the power to enforce law. So mm. we have international treaties and international law, but they are not on the same level when it comes to enforce uh, when it comes to enforcement so um, that's why i'd like to think in more regional um, areas when it comes to regulatory regulation or, or regulatory answers to those things and um, my result for today would be if we have to prioritize the next steps then i would again apply the traditional risk management approach and say imminent danger with highly potential harms is where we need to tackle or to, to come up with interventions at once. So for instance, uh, forms of cyber booming in, uh, in game chats or on platforms, uh, we need buttons or supporting, um, supporting report procedures at once here, because that's the only way that we, a child can pull some adult into that risky situation um, and to take to tackle that risk. But then again, we have a lot of underlying risks and we need to tackle that, those too, but with other approaches. For instance, by um, providing more resilience, more infrastructural support for um, ch children who think that there might be risk, but um, are not sure yet whether it's really imminent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first two things that, that mm -hmm. I would tackle. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Elizabeth, 
what would you like to um what, what what's the what's the the puzzle in front of you that you think it's time for research or theory <laughs> to solve uh i'm thinking that maybe um so i don't think that we even even though we have been working uh for many many years uh, a lot empirically uh, on online risk and opportunities for children and youth. I don't think we really know how it is to grow up digitally. Uh, we, we don't know because we don't have sufficient panel studies. We don't have studies that follow the same children throughout childhood and, and knowing what it means that, that to have something happen to you, uh, have experiences, have different backgrounds and how that might interplay or, or cause consequences that we fear when you're older. So I think that, that uh, methodological innovation, panel studies, and also uh, this component of more comparative studies over time is essential with the same children, not new children. It seems to me like the internet generations are getting shorter or and shorter so that the 10 year old has have a completely different internet experience and technological uh, strategies than 15 year olds or 20 year olds. So in order to gain insight of what digital media effects is, we, we need that that methodological tool that takes time and is complicated. So that's that's the one thing. And then I think that that what is needed from us perhaps uh, collectively is also not to tell parents and politicians and, and others not to worry, but at least give them some direction of their worry. So what we find from empirical research is that parents and, and, and others are worried about a lot of things. And some of these things might not cause harm or might be very unlikely, but things that do cause harm and are very likely are not such a big worry. So I usually say to people, you're allowed to worry, but let me suggest based on research, things that you should worry about. And I think maybe that could be helpful so that you can, can not having to worry about everything all the time because it makes us all exhausted, but to, to focus that worry on what actually in places where there is a likelihood of harm and where we need to have intervention and help. Yeah, thank you. I think you and Stefan have agreed for across different perspectives and uh, and why not? Um, Giuseppe, um, I think in your talk, you mentioned lots of kind of future technological changes. Um, I just wonder if that's where you see the, the kind of the conceptual challenges um, coming or maybe you have others in mind. Yes, I mean, the, the main difficulty is that, um, you know, we are here to assess uh, online risks and the effects they might have, but, you know, these environments are changing constantly. And, and, and so th that, that's a challenge, how to, to analyze, collect data, uh, to have access to data often, uh, because those are available. Um, I think there are new... so. That's there is a wider, let's say, methodological problem that I think Elizabeth mentioned. I think it's true. Panel studies, mm -hmm. uh, whatever is possible. I mean, I, I deal more with uh, with experiments, but experiments you know, cannot be done in some cases for obvious ethical reasons. So uh, you know, we need to rethink the tools, the kind of you know epistemic, uh, uh, let's say, approaches we have to to, to this stuff. And then I think uh, we also have to think a bit more creatively about the new vulnerabilities. I think there are interactions that often are uh, underestimated. So uh, the example I usually like to make is the one of cognitive scarcity. So people that are in particular conditions uh, of you know, socioeconomic status or, or whatever type of condition at home, that affects the the cognitive tools at their disposal in terms of evaluating uh, uh, things. And that means that if they have to evaluate, among other things, uh, risks online and risks uh, about you know, using certain platforms rather than not, or what, what's going on there, or to monitor where the kids are, uh, including the kids themselves, then is affected by this cognitive scarcity condition. And, and so you have these new vulnerabilities that are very subtle, very very complex because um, you see uh, not only differences, you know, uh, in parents in terms of, of you know, how likely they perceive a risk, 
but what type of information they use to build the risk perception, what type of reasoning they follow, what type of heuristic they use. And, and that makes it complicated because you understand that if you were to intervene, you are likely to find many audiences, many different type of, of potential you know, targets that they may not respond in the same way. You know, one solution for one group can be a boomerang for another one. So you find yourself in this difficult position. So um, so a lot of work to do yet, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, I'm always, sometimes I'm always glad to be, uh, yes, thinking about the theory and the research rather than as it were solving the world's um, problems, which is yeah. uh, a challenge I know that many in the um, audience today are, are facing. Um, Maria, did we did we manage to uh, address some of the questions in the in the chat, or or there are many more that uh, remain to be uh, I think on another occasion? Yeah, there are definitely many more nuances uh, in the questions, and there was a call for uh, what we think should be the the new research, the forthcoming research, uh, where to go for resources, what are the good examples that we can learn from uh, in the different areas. So I think we what we might do is try to write up some of these answers because we we have a lot of questions that we haven't really answered in great detail. Uh, so we will try to follow up the the webinar, and you can follow the uh, Children Online Research and Evidence web page uh, which is core eu uh, and uh, we will try to follow up on the questions that we haven't answered so far but thank you very much to all the speakers i think they, they've been great at provoking more questions uh, as well there are, there are always more um, questions than answers and answers generate more questions um but um uh, that's that's the nature of 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 facing a, a changing and a challenging domain and that's what makes the work interesting and and we hope um, important uh, so i think we are now um at the end of our time and um, the audience and indeed the speakers have um, uh, been very um dedicated and staying with us and giving lots of energy into this occasion so i will just um uh, close at this point and say um, thank you so much to all of the speakers um, for participation. Thank you to the audience for asking uh, many excellent questions. We will um, uh, likely edit um, top and tail and then post this recording um, on the coreevidence.eu website um, where you can find a lot of other um, resources and blog posts and activities going on. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much to um, everybody and I wish you all a good um, whatever it is, morning, evening, night. Um, thank you.